Hi, this is uh, Danielle Karapkin speaking to you from the Bayat in Thornhill, Ontario. We are studying Morin of Uchim, Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed. We are currently in uh, chapter 12 of the second section uh, where we've been plotting along. Um, and uh, the Rambam has been describing for us um, a, his system of cosmogony or cosmology, different words for it, or his astronomical system, the way he understands it, and the way that God uses a process of intermediation of malachim, of angels, which the Rambam had identified as the celestial bodies and the celestial spheres, and the intelligences behind those celestial spheres in order to emanate and to affect everything that goes on in our worldly existence. Um, there was something very profound that the Rambam had said back in chapter 11 last week when we first began this idea, and that is he gave a mashal, he gave an analogy. And the analogy wanted to point out that God's benevolent flow of himself into our world to cause things to come into existence and to generate and to degenerate and to be enlightened or disenlightened. All of this is not that God created an entire system in order to do this for man, but rather um, God by his nature is a God of emanation. And God by his nature created things that emanate from him um, and that in turn emanate to the lower creations and the lower existent beings of our world. And it's a very humbling thought. The analogy that he had given, the mashal that he had given, is if you have a wealthy person, there are some people who are only wealthy and uh, self-sustaining, and no one else benefits from their wealth. But the mega rich, the mega wealthy, are people who, through their successful businesses, are able to employ and help other people become wealthy as well. You know, think of um, all of the, the very, very wealthy people uh, who own stock brokerage companies and uh, Amazon.com and, and, uh, and um, Bill Gates and all of these other very wealthy people who have made hundreds and thousands of people wealthy in their wake because of the companies, successful companies that they ran. This doesn't mean that their objective in their endeavor was to make those people wealthy, but rather the overflow of their success onto others per force. And that is the way that he described God. And it almost sounds like this, it's a mechanistic process, meaning that God's, God by his very existence does not mindfully emanate, but God is constantly emanating like a radio tower or uh, that it emanates radio waves or or a, a a piece of uranium that radiates radiation by its very nature and this is a little bit troublesome because we would like to think of god as being a mindful god as being satisfied with his handiwork and mindfully and deliberately uh, giving forth of his emanation but in this Aristotelian slash Judaic model that the Rambam is trying to present to us, it's almost like he's straddling that fence between whether God deliberately emanates and creates or whether it's simply a product of the nature of God by virtue of whom he is. And this is something that we're going to be developing over the course of time, but I wanted to use that as our introduction to chapter 12. The first part of chapter 12, I must confess, is a little bit more technical using philosophical, um, uh, um, using a philosophical methodology to define a process that the Rambam calls overflow um, or shefa in Hebrew. And I'm going to uh, bring up, therefore, the handout that I have for today, which is really just a basic outline of, uh, of Moren of Uchim chapter 12. And this, I believe, will be, uh, hopefully, it will be helpful to us to be able to, to just go through the basic points step by step of chapter 12. So the, the title that I've given for this chapter uh, is that God overflows into our world. And the general philosophical introduction, without getting into the specifics of 
what God does to overflow to the celestial spheres and the intelligences there, thereof to affect our world, the Rambam gives a general first three points of an introduction. Everything produced in time, he says, must have an efficient cause. And anything that exists in our realm of existence, this terrestrial existence, is produced in time. Whether that cause is a body or not, it is not the matter of the body that produces the product, but rather its form. And remember, we're dealing with Aristotelian science where everything that has uh, structure is made up of form and matter. And even if the object that produces or causes the things in our world to exist is a body, we'll talk about the celestial spheres and the celestial bodies later, but we have to bear in mind that it is not the matter of those spheres that causes or gives rise to the things that exist in our world, but rather it is the form of those things that give rise to the things in our world. And we're going to see also an example of, let's say, fire. Fire causes things in our world to change by heating them up or combusting them. It is not the matter of the fire, but rather the form of heat within the fire that gives rise to that change. This producing agent may have itself also been produced in time. That's point number two. But when going up the chain of causalities, we eventually must, sorry, that's a typo, we must arrive at the prime cause, which itself cannot have been produced in time. This is the Aristotelian right from the introduction to section two. even among non-physical things. There must be thing, some, something where the buck stops at the prime cause, okay? Now, number three, why does something come into being at one particular point in time and not before? If it's cause for being, for existing, if it's cause for being existed before. In other words, if I have a piece of, of metal and it could have been hot before, but it only gets hot now, so why is it coming into being as a heated element only taking place now? Uh, this could be for one of two reasons. And these are the, we'll, we're gonna refer back to 3A or 3B throughout our, our discussion of the technical details of what's going on here. Either A, if the cause of the product is a body, meaning if the thing that causes the thing in our world to exist is another body that causes it to, to exist, then there was insufficient relationship between the cause and the effect, between the cause and the product up until a specific point of time. Let's say, and we'll, we'll get to that specific in just a minute, um, where the two things, the cause and its effect, were too distant from each other spatially in order for the cause to have an impact on the, on the product. But B could be if the cause of the product is not a body and it's pure form, and there are things which are pure form, God is pure form, and God's intelligences, his angels are pure form, and therefore proximity to the product is not an issue because we can only speak about things that are distant and proximal when we're talking about uh, objects that possess matter, but objects that don't possess matter are not confined spatially, right? We've learned about that throughout section one of Morin of Uchim. Then the only reason why the product did not come into existence or achieve the change that we uh, only see anew is because the product's matter wasn't yet in a position to receive the influence of the cause. There may have been something in the product itself which was deficient or simply not ready to receive the influence of the, of the emanation of the cause. These, uh, he's speaking now in generalities, and now with these three premises, this general philosophical introduction, we're going to go into the specifics of what he's talking about. So we're gonna clarify uh, 3A, that sometimes <clears throat> what brings about things in our world is another body, something which, has, which possesses both matter and form. So the example that he gives is a piece of metal becomes hot through fire in one of two ways. Either the fire is in direct contact with the metal, and he also uses the example of wax uh, in his example. So wax will melt and turn into liquid at a certain temperature. 
and why was it solid up until today and only today it melted either because uh, the fire came in direct contact with the metal or wax or the fire is at a distance from the metal or the wax and the air that surrounds the metal is heated by the fire the heat the heated air in turn heats the metal or wax and all the rambam is just explaining is that causes and effects come about either directly or indirectly via another agent and that's fine so fire is our is our primary element it's the causative element which we would say is the body even though you might think of fire as not having a body but it is in a it is bodily in a sense because it is one of the elements of our world and therefore it is a body that has a causative effect on something else that exists in our world and therefore it, you know it's going to depend upon how proximal the fire is to the object whether it's metal or wax to determine whether the fire will be able to impact the object that it wishes to impact if the fire is too distant from the metal or wax then the, then the product will not be heated by the fire. If the metal or wax becomes heated at some point in time, whereas previously it had been cold, this indicates that either a new fire came into existence that heated it, where there was no previous fire, the fire is newly created, or the fire may have existed a long time, the fire was always there, but it, it has newly become close enough to the metal to heat it. In either case, a new relationship between the fire and the metal or wax has been introduced. And he says, this example should serve to explain anything in our world that comes into existence at a particular time, which is brought into existence by another body. This would include any new phenomenon, which involves the combination of elements in our world. So if you have a compound structure, a carpenter makes a chair, and you can ask the question, we know that the efficient cause of the, of the chair is the carpenter. It is the form in the carpenter's mind that makes the chair. Why was the chair not a chair yesterday? It was just a pile of wood. And the carpenter came along. Why didn't the chair exist yesterday? The chair didn't exist yesterday because the carpenter was either distant from the wood or the wood was not ready to be made into a chair because the wood, let's say, was wet and it needed to dry out. And therefore the carpenter had to wait until the wood was ready to be formed into a chair. You can come up with any number of examples to describe this process that the Rambam is describing in this first part. But now let's clarify 3B, where the uh, things come into existence in our world or things change in our world not through a combination of elements because we're not dealing with uh, really physical things that come about that that are products in our world that are changing but rather the giving rise of new forms within bodies and we'll clarify what we mean uh, uh, later but uh, but products that possess form are brought into existence by other forms um, and we know that um, in our previous example it was heat that produced uh, the, the heated piece of metal. But over here, let's say we wanna talk about something which is pure form, which is giving rise to something that changes in our world. As such, these products with form are not produced gradually as our combined elements, but rather the product is spawned spontaneously and immediately upon contact with the spawning form. And here's where we should, really explain what the Rambam means. When something is made of pure form, and it is such as God himself, or such as one of the intelligences of the spheres that we've been speaking about up until you know these last few weeks, when those things provide influence to things which need their form changed in this world, those that, that thing happens instantaneously because there's nothing bodily, there's nothing of the matter which is being changed but only the form is being changed within the things in this world the most obvious example of this is intellect because intellect in a, a human intellect or even animal intellect to a limited degree is um, pure form uh, it is something that connects with uh, the cosmos according to this aristotelian model 
and uh, we are changed or transformed. Our minds can be transformed through the celestial influences of these disembodied intelligences. And we'll get to that in just a moment. It says, we cannot suggest that the reason why the form and the product had not previously been produced is, a, is because of a relational gap between the agent and the product, since the form of the agent has no body and can therefore not be depicted in terms of distance or being far away from the thing it wishes to uh, affect. Our only conclusion is that the matter of the product that is eventually to receive the form of the agent is not ready yet to receive the form of the agent. And therefore think in terms of the human intellect, and this is my insertion in brackets to what the Rambam is referring to, think in terms of human intellect being influenced by the active intellect, which is that lowest of intelligences that we've discussed uh, up until now. Human beings' minds uh, are influenced not uh, at one specific point in time, not because the source of that influence came into being or was too distant from us, but rather I, as a human being, did not yet sufficiently develop my intellect to be ready for that influence. That influence was always, always radiating or always broadcasting, and it was just waiting, so to speak, for me as a human being to develop myself sufficiently so that I could uh, hook up to that uh, broadcast and receive that influence. And so that's the, what the Rambam is describing. There is a constant emanation and flow that is coming from above, that is striving, as it were, to uh, be uh, influential upon forms of our world that are pure form and where the, the object, the matter is not being impacted at all, such as my mind will be altered, but my body remains the same. And why is it that only as I become more mature and developed do I receive these amazing thoughts and ideas from some external source? This is what's being described. It's only because I had not yet developed myself properly in order to be able to sort of be a, a, a vessel to receive those emanations, those influences. Point number six, we're almost done. We had pre clarified previously that all forms in our world are a product of the intelligences, the angels of the cosmos. Remember, the Rambam defines the uh, celestial intelligences that Aristotle talks about as malachim, as the angels of Tanakh, and specifically of the intelligence of the lowest sphere known as the active intellect. And we're not going to get into that Again, but I refer you to our previous discussions at the end of section one of Moren Nebuchim, where we had a lengthy discussion of the active intellect and how the Rambam understands it. But then he says, because the intellect or angel is without matter, its influence or lack thereof must be of the three B type, since we cannot speak of distance when discussing matterless forms. This is what we've gone over already. We therefore use the term overflow, and in Hebrew it's shefa, in Arabic, it's fayid, and it's, uh, it's a term that, that is used in uh, Farabian philosophy, which is one of Maimonides' uh, forebears in the Islamic philosophical world who talked about this idea as well, to describe the influence of these intelligences in the cosmos. It is like, and it's, and it's described, says the Rambam, as a source of water that overflows in all directions and is constantly giving forth water. And I described it as a broadcast of waves because in the medieval world, they did not know of waves that are being broadcast. So therefore, the, I guess the more apt metaphor, if you're a medieval uh, philosopher, is uh, a wellspring that is constantly flowing forth with water. But the proviso is, is that its effects are not dependent upon proximity to the source. The water flows out infinitely, it's not confined by space, and all you have to be there is ready to receive this divine or this shefa influence. The sole criterion as to whether a product will receive its influence is the degree of receptivity of that product. And therefore, in reference to human beings, which is really what we think of mostly when we think of this process of overflow, is how receptive is the human mind to receive the divine overflow that is coming from the cosmos and coming from the active intellect. 
Point number eight, and we only uh, we have uh, 11 points today. Point number eight, the creator is the same in his overflow as the intelligences. God overflows his being to bring about the existence of our world. And we said he does so via these intermediary spheres and intelligences. And the second point that Rambam makes over here is that he describes two types of overflow, one that brings existence and life to our world, and another type of overflow is to bring prophecy to a prophet. And this is going to discuss uh, uh, later on in section two when he gets uh, to a discussion of the whole phenomenon of prophecy. This is a very important discussion for the Rambam in that prophecy is the same it is sort of the same mechanism, same process whereby existence comes to our world through an, an overflow of divine emanation. The same process is how a prophet is able to achieve divine knowledge as an overflow of divine emanation coming into the mind of the prophet and the prophet overflows that himself and shares that with the rest of the world. Point number nine. We will find scripture using this language of overflow to describe a God's influence on our world. And he'll get to that. He'll, we're going to cite a couple of psukim, a couple of verses to reflect that momentarily. Before he does, though, he wants to just point out, but in reality, this is just a metaphor for our minds are incapable of truly grasping how one who is separate from matter can influence others since we think in spatial terms. It's very difficult for us to conceive of the idea of something disembodied, having no spatial confinement whatsoever, and being able to influence through emanation onto uh, bodies of our world. This difficulty in grasping this idea is what brought some of the multitude, he says, you know, some of the common folk, to imagine that when God wishes to influence something in our world, he dispatches an angel who descends, you know, spatially goes down and makes contact with that which is being influenced. They also erroneously believe that these angels have bodies, and they also erroneously believe that God uses language in the same way we do by giving verbal commands to effect his will. And this is all, of course, provincial, the Rambam feels. This is not really getting to the essence of the way God behaves. This is all he says, the evil impulse. It's the Yetzir Hara of the faulty imagination faculty. And again, he's giving us that disclaimer before he quotes the verses in Tanakh, because he wants to make sure that when we read these verses, we don't read them literally, as some of the multitude read it. Don't be deceived by your imagination faculty, which will conjure images of a big wizard with a long white beard in the sky, sending forth angels with, uh, with cherubic faces and wings flying down, uh, 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 you know, flowing and 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 wafting down into our world and touching things and making. He says that's all. That's all just metaphor. Uh, and the last, uh, almost before he gets to the psukim, he says non-Jewish thinkers also discuss the influence of the actual bodies of the heavenly spheres. So he says up until now we've talked about the formless cosmological entities, which are these intelligences that we talked about in previous chapters. But remember, last week's chapter said that the cosmos outside, above our world are comprised of uh, things which have matter. It's a certain kind of elevated matter that is not the same kind of matter of our world because it's eternal matter, but these things have bodies and the disembodied intelligences. So the non-Jewish thinkers tell us that the heavenly bodies also influence our world in the fashion of 3A, which is when one body which has form wishes to affect another body which has form in our world. And since we are dealing with bodies affecting other bodies, and he says, this is the science of astrology, where if a, an object is coming into formation, under a certain astrological configuration, you know, Sagittarius or Capricorn or something like that, then it will affect its temperament and its condition and so forth in the world. The Rambam says they, they say this, and it's quite unclear 
how or to what degree the Rambam subscribes to this idea of an a- astrological forces being born under a certain star or something being created under a certain star will affect its makeup or its temperament. But the Rambam does not subscribe to astrology. This is my quote in brackets as it pertains to controlling human free will. When it comes to free will, the Rambam is very explicit in Hilchot Shuvah, chapter five, that you you cannot say that a person's free will in, is in any way compromised by what star they're born under. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the Rambam doesn't su- subscribe to astrology at all, but it does suggest that he's a, that he uh, that he wishes to limit the influence of these stars as bodies affecting other bodies in this world. It is possible that a person born under a certain star, like the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat says, a person born under a certain star will have a, a predisposition towards aggression because he's born under the red star. But that doesn't affect that person's free will to, dis- to determine how they're going to use that aggressive tendency. And that's why the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says, that a person who was born with aggressive tendencies because he's born under the red star or the red astrological configuration of Mars uh, is going to be born as an aggressive person. That means he could grow up to be a murderer, which is an evil thing to be, but he could also grow up to be a butcher, which is fairly neutral, or he could grow up to be a physician, a surgeon, or a moil, uh, which is a positive thing. But all of those things that give him a predisposition towards being a blood shedder that does not affect the individual's free will as to how they wish to run to lead their lives vis-a-vis good versus evil. And that's the point that the Rambam makes. And perhaps that's the reason why he distances himself in a very subtle way from the study of astrology, because he wants to perhaps sway people away from that idea, even though the Rambam may feel that it is a legitimate uh, approach to looking at the cosmos, that astrology may have some legitimacy to it, but it's not important for our purposes. And that's why it's almost mentioned in passing. So getting back to what he had started with, that he's going to provide us with some verses from scripture that describe this overflow with the disclaimer, don't read it literally. And with the disclaimer that realize that the effects of the cosmos are limited upon us and that they will not affect our free will. Some examples of scripture ascribing overflow to God. And the first Pasuk that he brings is from the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 2, verse 13. And um, uh, that, uh, let me just make sure I have the, yeah, I have the right. They have forsaken me. There are two evils that my people have done. They have forsaken me, who is the source of living water, which is usually the term for a wellspring that is incessantly flowing forth its water. And the second evil they have done, not only have they forsaken me, but they've gone to stagnant waters of false gods. Okay, But the point is, is that you see from this verse that God is described as an incessantly flowing source of emanation. Okay, That describes God's overflow. And perhaps the more important verse, because he uses both the first part of the verse and the second part of the verse, is from Tehillim Psalms, chapter 36, verse 10. Ki imecha makor chayim, because with you, God, is the source of all life. You are a source. Makor means a source of, let's say, like a wellspring, a source of, um, of something that is flowing from that source. And so there, too, you see that God is described as the source of emanation. and In the latter part of the verse, it says, through your light or through your illumination, we will see light. And so the second part of that verse refers to the condition of enlightened intellect that man receives. Not only is God's overflow responsible for giving rise to all of existence in a material way, but God's influence, his divine overflow, gives rise to human intellect, to enlightened and ennobled human intellect as well. So that's the basic idea that the Rambam is describing in chapter 12. And the the question is, in the larger frame of things, 
why is this significant to the Rambam? So one of the things we've already alluded to is that uh, in later chapters, the Rambam is going to be discussing prophecy and prophecy is described as a process of overflow. And because prophecy is a cornerstone of the faith of the Jewish people, it really is quite important for us to understand it in this way that it has been contextualized as a part of divine overflow that gives rise to all of existence. It's also important for us to understand it for the general project of understanding Ba'ase Merkava, to understand how cosmological forces impact our existence in this world. But finally, I'd like to refer you to something. I, I was referred recently by one of my congregants to a book called Maimonides Between Philosophy and Halakha. It's a relatively new book published by Kitab and Urim Publishers from 2016. It was edited by Professor Lawrence Kaplan, and it, it, it basically synopsizes and presents in a very nice format a series of lectures that Rav Yoshev Ber Soloveitcha gave uh, in 1950 and 1951. He gave specific lectures on Morin Avuchim, on the Guide for the Perplexed. And on page 49, which is part of the introduction of this work, um, uh, Rav Soloveitchik describes this act of overflow as a depiction of divine chesed, of divine kindness. We know this principle based on the pasuk, based on the verse, Olam ki amarti, Olam chesed yibane, the world is built through chesed, through kindness. What is divine chesed? It is this divine overflow that the Rambam has been describing in this chapter. And he writes as follows, the overflow of perfection onto others from both the scholar and prophet, this letting others participate in one's existence described in guide uh, section two, chapter 37, which we haven't yet studied, but we're gonna be talking about it when we learn about prophecy, recapitulates on the human level God's act of chesed, God's overflow of perfection in the creation of the world described in guide chapter 11, chapter 12 of section two, and chapter 53 of section three. An overflow, which means letting others participate in the divine existence. And just as the subject-object distinction is through this divine act of chesed effaced on the divine level, so through the human act of chesed on the part of the scholar and prophet, it is effaced on the human level. And that means that humans can impact others through their overflow and through their benevolent uh, sharing of themselves with others in the same way that God overflows to our world. Now, I want to sort of be very careful in our reading of this text, because remember, uh, as I started off this chapter today, the Rambam seems to be suggesting that there's something mechanistic about God's overflow, that by virtue of his existence, he overflows of himself uh, and emanates that causes the well-being of an existence of everything that exists in our world. Does that mean that it's not chesed because we associate chesed with volition? and goodness of heart and a decision to actively help others? Not necessarily, but it may require us to redefine what chesed is. Chesed may be that I develop myself to the point where I, by my very nature, am so good that I impact and overflow to others my goodness by virtue of my existence, just like God. It's a very interesting thought, and I wanna leave us there at this point for today. So we're going to hold it here for today and uh, wish you a good rest of the week and we'll see you, Bezrat Hashem. Um, we're going to pick it up in two weeks from today because I will be traveling next week. Take care, everyone. All be well.